Good morning, everybody. Uh, we are here to give you an update on uh, the efforts to address the fire in the Santiam Canyon and our recovery efforts. We're going to start off with an update from Sheriff Joe Cass. Hi, thanks. Mr. Chair, um, to start with, uh, the most recent numbers I have is the fire has reached 190,000 acres, a little over 190,000 acres in the Beachy Creek Fire. There's 545 fire personnel working on the fire right now. Uh, our evacuation levels have not changed since yesterday afternoon. The evacuated areas, the closed areas are Detroit, Idana, Brighton Bush, Mill City, Gates, and then Highway 22 east of Highway 226. And then the North Fork Road corridor, of course, as well, uh, north of Highway 22. Um, we still, uh, we don't have any change in the number of fatalities. We have four deaths related to the fire, and then we still have one person that's unaccountable, uh, un unaccounted for, and that is, uh, went out in the media release yesterday, uh, Mr. George Atia, and we're still putting teams together to try to locate uh, him or, or anybody else that may still be up in the area, but that's the only one that we know of at this point that's unaccounted for. Um, if you have or know of somebody that's missing, we have contact information uh, that you can call in and let us know. And then also, if you have uh, property up in the canyon and you want a deputy to drive by and check on that property, we can do that. The property check phone number for Detroit and Idana is 503-798-6823. Between uh, eight and five, seven days a week we're doing that. And we will continue with the enhanced patrols up in that area. We'll be working with the Lynn County Sheriff's Office and a bunch of other law enforcement agencies who've provided resources to continue to put patrol up in that closed area. Um, additionally, uh, we've got a, several phone calls recently about uh, FBI phone calls, checking on folks that do live in that region. That is, that is actually what is going on. The FBI is checking to try to make sure that we do not lose sight of anybody that may be up there that we didn't get contact with. So the FBI is doing some follow-up phone calls there. I think that's it for now. Thank you, Sheriff. Can you give an update on Lions that happened? Lions in Mahama, west of the 226 intersection, is uh, back opened up into level two. Does that mean people can go back to their homes? Yes, in those areas. A lot of people don't know what 226 is, but they may know where Gingerbread House is. Right there by the Gingerbread House at that intersection with the flashing yellow light, for those that are up there, yes. In the and that's west of that intersection. East of that intersection is still closed. Well, somewhat related, and I won't mind if the sheriff interjected specifics, but uh, just I'll start with talking about Highway 22 closure. We had the opportunity to go up there last Wednesday. Uh, I think things will stick in my mind for a long time, but it's it's surely and strictly unsafe. Um, there's a picture right here that happened yesterday, a state patrol car uh, put the brakes on, got that close, but that's what's going on. Trees are still unsafe, we're told eight, and I got a new number. In fact, I got to put on my glasses. I, I thought it was eight and 10,000, but it's saying of eight, 10 to 80,000 trees need to be secured, removed, um, a big job. The other thing we saw, and, and certainly is a health and safety thing, I'm not counting fires themselves that aren't completely out, is rocks falling down in the roadway. If you can think of all that area, especially like Big Cliff Dam to Detroit, the rock wall, they have fencing up over the years to help, but uh, that's got to be replaced, taken back to take a long time. ODOT's closed up the road completely. I wonder, do you have any in new information on 22 itself? Just that we're working with ODOT, and they do have that section closed where they're working on uh, removing trees and things like that. But we're still working with the community and with ODOT to try to help out with any way we can in providing very limited access to some of the areas around there. So yesterday I was listening on the radio, and there was a, I just overheard a gentleman talking, uh, pretty mad at the Marion County Sheriff's Office, sorry, Sheriff, um, for not letting him get back to meet his wife, who was already in the evacuation area. and I. I understand his frustration, understand the frustration of so many people, but it's not safe yet. We have to know where people are, and there could be further evacuations as time goes on and weather changes. So I hope people will cooperate and understand we're doing everything we can. It leads me into the little, the next steps of recovery. I so dearly want to get people back on their properties. 
and we'll, I'll just make you that pledge. We'll do everything we can. I think the board agrees with me. They often don't, but um, we want to get people back and get roadblocks out of the way, be pragmatic and common sense, and I don't care if they're on tents or mobile homes. I'm premature in saying this, but perhaps people can get ready. We want to get them back. Did talk to the governor, at least told her my plans last Saturday, and I think we'll get agreement. We're going to do everything we can as soon as possible to get people back, and, and that's, that's our pledge. Over the last week, we have uh, opened uh, an emergency shelter at the fairgrounds. Uh, over 1,000 people checked into the fairgrounds uh, between Tuesday morning, uh, starting about 2 a.m. Uh, so uh, on Sunday, we handed it over, and over operations of the fairground shelter to the American Red Cross. Uh, we also sheltered over 1,400 animals and livestock um, on the fairgrounds, um, but a number of those animals are returning to their homes, so that's very good news. We're, we're down to just over 700 animals now, which is about half the number that we had at the height of the crisis. Um, that includes 214 horses and 240 large uh, livestock. Yesterday, President Trump uh, approved a major disaster declaration uh, for many counties in Oregon, including Marion County. What this means is that there's now federal funding available to support uh, our recovery efforts and disaster relief. Um, if you or someone you know has been affected by the Santiam, by the fire in the Santiam Canyon, um, you can register online today, and that's disasterassistance.gov, and you can also call 1-800-621-3362, uh, and that funding would in will include temporary housing and home repairs low-cost loans to cover uninsured property and losses. That's something that we're going to be working with FEMA to make available to our community. You can wave your life. I wasn't done. It doesn't matter. <laughs> if I could, just a couple more thoughts. Um, and it's kind of personal this time. Last week, I kind of got choked up. It surprised me. Um, in fact, frankly, embarrassed about it, but thoughts started going back to family and friends doing things and got my attention, just didn't have time to recover. I still have those thoughts, and one of the things I want to do is acknowledge, and I, th I just know this is going to come out, so many private people, I'm, uh, certainly the fire department's working their tails off, but private people with their own machinery, the farmers uh, in the areas, uh, I'll, give, I'll call out uh, Lule's and Etzel's and Heiberger's in our area, put out fires that I know saved Sublimity State and, and perhaps beyond. So. I'm sure that'll come out. I want to acknowledge the work that private people have done. And then, this is where it really gets personal. So I told you I had a little trouble last week. Um, I got a call later that evening from an old friend. I wasn't going to say his name, but I think the world needs to know good people. hope I don't do that again. But uh, Walt Beglaw called me up, former district attorney, and he had watched me on some television, I guess. And uh, he frankly said, are you all right? I said, oh, Walt, I'm, I'm embarrassed, but yeah, I'm fine. And then, then he went on, I said, well, how are you, where are you? And he's actually told me after worrying about me, he was actually in Washington, evacuated um, his house on the Mackenzie, just burned down. And I thought, why, why would you possibly care about me? But, so that brings me up to where, <clears throat> if people are having trouble, we do have some resources in the county I want to make, make public. Um, we have a Marion County psychi Psychiatric Crisis Hotline. The number is 503-585-4949. I'll just say it once more, 503-585-4949. And a Marion County Youth and Family Crisis Hotline, and that number is 503-576-4673. So my point in hope it's important. Start looking around at people and make sure you're taking care of them. Um, find out who your friends are. Question? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I, uh, I, I want to make the point that we still have um, a crisis in, fr in, in the middle of a crisis in the middle of a crisis. And if you think about it, uh, uh, when, we spoke, when I spoke to the governor last week, um, you know, it's almost like COVID was a warm up getting ready for this but we think about COVID uh, and and I personally know personally myself and other businesses that have been struggling during COVID and then to have this happen and we've got these other crises within it still uh, we want to 
acknowledge the sheriff and uh, his staff and, and how they've been, you know, uh, working so hard, number one, to get people out. I was there uh, at 1230 at night when his people were going through the town of Detroit with their sirens on, knocking on doors and getting people out. And, and uh, I'll never forget that. Um, but since then, they've been working hard. Uh, if you think about it, both the marinas were destroyed in Detroit. The buildings were destroyed, but they had over 200 boats still sitting in the water. Uh, we did get, last Friday, we got Army Corps to slow down the water um, a little bit to be able to buy more time. This week, his deputies uh, were able to move the boats from the shallow marina, uh, Detroit Lake Marina, over to um, Haynes Marina, they're still sitting there. They've obviously been able to recover many trailers that were in town and move those trailers over to Mongold to stage to get ready to get those boats out. So that's something. Detroit lost its water system uh, the, in the fire, the, their pumps, their filters. Uh, so they're, they're working on trying to recover that and, and, and I'm sure our emergency management is helping. This, this disaster will help collect, it, collect them. Um, and I think it's important to note that Marion County has the most incorporated cities of any county in Oregon. We have 20 incorporated cities. And if you think you take Salem and Kaiser and Woodburn, you know, those big cities out, you've got all these little cities up in the canyon and, and in different places that uh, really, really uh, need our help and continue to recovery. Cash donations can be made uh, for the recovery to the Santa Am Hospital. Santa Am Hospital has set up a uh, Santa Am Wildlife Relief Fund, Wildfire Relief Fund. Uh, all these links can be found on our website. The Red Cross uh, is, is putting people up in hotels and, and reimbursing the fairgrounds and those types of things. So Red Cross can take cash donations to help uh, with the relief. And the United Way here in the local valley has set up a relief fund and is, is taking donations as well as cash. So those are three uh, entities that people can donate to to help. Um, one of our concerns and one of the things that I'm uh, working on, we've kind of tried to divide up things, is recovery. And in that recovery, um, people have been displaced. And uh, one of my concerns is that uh, I have not heard from our clerk uh, what the plan is to make sure people get their ballots for this election, and, and I'm anxiously waiting to hear what um, the clerk, Bill Burgess, is planning on doing to make sure people get ballots that are destroyed. Uh, they're, they, they haven't been able to go back to their house. Uh, and so we want to see that. Uh, that's an immediate need that we have um, that we're um, asking him for. Uh, and then the other thing is, is we're having a meeting tomorrow with, uh, I believe, Lynn, Lynn County. We're tr still struggling to get this meeting put together with Lynn County, our Public Works Planning Department, the Council of, of Governments, uh, to talk about what are some of the obstacles. They've already been working on us. What are the obstacles to rebuild? And obviously, we have to, to go in and clean up. But if you think about some of the homes that were destroyed up there, they were built in the 40s or 50s, and the code at that time allowed them to do things that code does not allow to do today. So we're going to be asking for some relief uh, from uh, building codes. We're already talking with the home builders and what that looks like. They have some experience in Grant County, uh, rebuilding Grant County. So uh, we'll be continuing to do that and um, uh, as we move forward asking for help from the state to relieve some of those codes and, and uh, allow people to get in. And as uh, Commissioner Brentano said, uh, there's going to be a lot of people. And I spoke with, uh, for example, some friends of mine that lost their place right on the lake. They said, hey, we started in a motorhome on our block property. We could go back to a motorhome while we re rebuild. So uh, we'll, we'll need to really, um, and I'm going to use your term, we need to be really liberal on uh, how we uh, uh, approach people and allowing them to go back and and uh, return to their homes um, and let them mourn and go through that whole process of, of uh, loss and recovery. Thank you, Commissioner. Sergeant Landers, with that, we'd be happy to take any questions. So as we take questions, I'll just ask that you uh, remain where you are, ask the question out loud, I'll repeat it so that way it can be heard a little bit easier for the people watching online. And we'll start here. Who has questions? I just want to know a couple things. Uh, I Can saw Core Harlan from uh, Coin TV in Portland. Uh, a 
about the damage to infrastructure all the way up the 22 corridor there? I saw so many bucket trucks, uh, utility vehicles, power line things. Can any, anybody sort of characterize the extent of the damage to all the public infrastructure is, that's there? And then secondly, maybe Ms. Uh, Mr. Cameron, could you address Detroit? Uh, sort of, I, I've just heard various things about it just being really badly burned, a lot of structures. Those are familiar places, those are meeting places for neighbors and people to get together. The extent of the damage to Detroit as well. So the, I'll summarize. Sorry. I had quite a bit there. So uh, really it's looking for the extent of the scope of damages up through the San Diego Canyon as well as Detroit specifically. Can we have the Brian answer the first? Uh, question. Brian is our public works director. Brian yeah, Nichols. I'll, I'll introduce myself since I, have, I have, haven't introduced myself yet. Brian Nicholas, I'm the Marion County Public Works Director. Uh, since in Marion County Emergency Management resides in Public Works, I'm also the county's public uh, emergency management director. Um, and that emergency management organization extends through all the departments in the county. Uh, to answer the question about utilities, uh, I think there's only one word, and that's extensive. Extensive loss. Um, I do believe, well, uh, the Fire Incident Command uh, does have a utilities unit, so every utility that's located up there has uh, a presence in the Incident Command, so they have uh, an awareness of the extent of damage on the ground. Um, and it really is extensive. Uh, I think uh, every utility, other than just a, some pockets here and there, um, those uh, the rebuilding will be extensive before um, those utility services are restored. What is it? Sewer, power lines, all of the above? I wish it was sewer. Yep. I, I think uh, any place where the fire came through, uh, overhead power is pretty much down, uh, and so is landline communications. Um, cellular is hit and miss. Some sites have been hit, uh, and so uh, cellular is, is hit and miss coverage. But actually, uh, Verizon and other providers have some service maps available on their websites where people can go to see in real time what that degraded coverage looks like. So that's a resource people can turn to. Um, mo some of the cities have lost their, their water systems like, um, like uh, Detroit and, and uh, Gates. Um, Lions, um, sounds like they came through it okay. They've got a system that's still functioning but with some damage. So it really is hit or miss. Um, and um, I think utilities will be putting out information in the next couple of days about what kind of timelines they're looking at for recovery. Right, and there'll be impacts to natural gas too. We've been getting some messages on and something that we have to work on to get restored. Yep. And I would say I think um, utilities really are still in the assessment period. So um, they want to put out good information uh, that people can rely on. One more on number of hazard trees that I heard mentioned up here, the number of hazard trees that might need to be removed. So he's asking for a clarification on the number of potential hazard trees. Go ahead. We were told from the command that there's between 10,000 and 80,000 trees up that Highway 22 corridor to the top of the pass, up to the Highway 20, that have to be removed to make the roadways safe and to make the, the side roads safe as well. This, this uh, patrol vehicle here was hit by, by a tree that fell on the road. So I'll answer your other question about Detroit. Uh, uh, being able to go up there last Wednesday to, to on a convoy, to, Army Corps had somebody stuck in their dam for 30 hours, so the sheriff organized with ODOT and utility companies that had hooks, et cetera, that we were able to go up there. And the, the things that you've probably seen the photos, if, if you go into Detroit, there was a gas station on the left totally gone, the motel on the left, it, it's all gone. It's just, it's just like somebody came in and dropped a bomb. You go into Cedars, anybody here ever been to Cedars? Well, it's quite the, the historic uh, place, totally gone. The sign's still standing. The only thing on Main Street on that side is the post office. Why? Who knows? Um, but there's extensive damage. I think probably the last number I saw was over 250 homes that are totally gone. Uh, I think there's approximately 400 up there. I don't. We're, we're, our our uh, community services department is and our assessor is looking at all those those information. Uh, but I will say this: you can you can see on Facebook right now. You can see hashtag Detroit Detroit Strong. Uh, there are people planning meetings saying we're going to rebuild. We need to get up there. It's a it's a community, not only just Detroit, but that whole canyon. And you asked, you talked about sewer. Well, this office has been working on trying to get a sewer project in that canyon for the last four or five years. Uh, 
Uh, this would be a great time. We're, we're expediting, hopefully, the engineering on that uh, as we're talking about this today. Uh, it would have been nice if there was a sewer system up there. And I think through this recovery, we need to rebuild that whole canyon in a way that it gives in infrastructure that will be long lasting. That's part of the whole process as we move forward, working with the feds and, and ourselves in the state to make some of those things happen. But the people are resistant. They are, they are uh, I, what's the word I want to say? Uh, resilient. Resilient, exactly. And they will come back stronger than ever. question from the statesman is that if there's going to be a process or policy change around permitting or the ability to expedite permitting that will be built. Yeah. Um, I spoke with uh, Mike Ergman, who's in charge of Marion Polk Home Builders, and uh, the State Home Building uh, uh, Association, um, my, I think it's uh, Long, Mike Long, I think it's, I can't remember his first name, but Long used to be with the state, um, Building Codes Division, and now he's running the state. Uh, you could do some research on Grant County when they had the fire that went through, and the commissioners can take some uh, unilateral action uh, policies. Those are being developed for us right now that allow people to uh, uh, build their homes back to a certain code. Uh, and so those are things that we're doing research on right now that would we, we potentially, uh, if the state doesn't give us relief, that we can take that will help, not as far as we could get with the state. But yes, there are uh, things that we can do as a board that will allow people to build back to, like, for example, the codes that were in place in 2000. Because uh, if you built your home in 1940, we ask this guy, we can't find those codes, right? Those, those are gone. But um, there are some things we can do that will help us get there. Does that, does that answer your question? Yes, there will be, but I'm not, uh, I, I can't tell you what those are currently. I can tell I you. Tomorrow we'll come out of that meeting with more details. Just a couple. I'm worried about debris. We'd love to have a place up there we could take it. And if that needs to be set up, there may have to be some concessions made uh, to let it go there and just store it. I mean, if you cut down uh, the transportation, uh, uh, our alternative right now would be bring it clear through Salem or to Covallis. There's got to be something better than that. So that's one we're going to be looking for. And then we'll try to be, a, again, my word, liberal, uh, trying to deal with septic tanks. Those are state rules and DEQ, but I'm just hoping there could be some type of reasonable concessions made to help people out. That's all those kind of angles is what we'll be looking for to make it better. We also know a, a number of properties up there were grandfathered in or were off, maybe not on the right Line non or non conforming to the use, and so it's going to be really important for us to work with the state to make sure that those people can be built as well. And then we've talked about in our own staff building up permits, inspectors, and, and be ready for the, the demand that hopefully and surely will come. was asking for clarification about what the downgrade from level three to level two in the Hama and Lyons neighborhood. Yes, um, in those level two areas, yes, people can go back and stay there, but they just need to be packed up and ready to go at a moment's notice if that goes back to level three for some reason. Past, past 226, that highway's still closed, past that intersection. I would mention too, just while I have a moment, uh, uh, up in that area, one of the main communication areas is, Hall, is Halls Ridge Radio Tower area. That impacts a lot of uh, emergency services up there, and that tower is no longer there. It's no longer standing. That area burned down. And so they're putting in a mobile uh, communications tower up there to make sure that we get some communications back up in there. And then the other thing I want to mention is the patrol car that you're looking at the picture of over here, that car was in motion when that tree fell on it. That's why the roads are so dangerous. It wasn't parked somewhere where a tree fell on it. That car was actually driving on Highway 22 when the tree fell on it. So I just want to clarify that. Sure. The, the Detroit water filter system is still on. Are there things that, that the county can do to start the process to help you get your people back up there and have that water? 
So the question was with the damage done to the Detroit water system, are there interim measures that can be taken to help with that? So um, Brian can answer this in more detail. If you think about the water crisis we had here in Salem, but what, 2018, uh, 200,000 people impacted. I'm sure that we will be able to handle 200 people if there is that many people to go back with their homes uh, with uh, some of the emergency equipment that we have for water supply. Uh, I'm one of those fortunate homes that's standing in a row of nine homes up there on cluster and um, but there is no water. So, you know, I, I was, if, if I'm even allowed to go back, who knows? smoke and some of those ho houses, asbestos, you know, th this is DEQ stuff that we got to talk about. But Brian, you want to talk about what you guys have available that would handle the water? I, I do ex I anticipate it will be something that um, starts out rudimentary and grows over time. We typically work directly with the city leadership uh, to figure out what type of temporary solutions they think can work best for them. But I would expect temp uh, a mobile water delivery service of some sort to, um, once people are allowed to return to the area and and, and stay in their homes. There's a, there's a process that uh, cities need to go through to make sure that homes are truly safe to dwell. And so that needs to be completed first. And then, uh, but once that order is, is, is provided and people can return to their homes, there'll be some support and services. But yeah, it, it, I think it'll, turn, it'll start out rudimentary with some sort of water service, delivery service, or something like that until systems can be, can be constructed and put in place. And this really is an opportunity to think larger um, about services throughout the canyon. Commissioner Cameron also mentioned the extensive damage up there in Detroit. So combined with the danger of the trees, the rock slides, and, and the number of drones that are even habitable in Detroit, it could be a while before people are able to forgive their uh, impacts. I'll get a tank. So the question is, is, uh, is there going to be a resource where people can go to find the status of certain structures? There will be at some point as we get that put together, we'll get that information out through our PIO and, and uh, the county will as well as soon as we get that information available. Right now, it depends on the area and whether we've been able to get in there and get a good look at everything yet. I think that, that's one of the differences I heard uh, on a call we were on yesterday. Lincoln County's telling FEMA, hey, come on in, we're ready to go. We can't get in. We, I mean, we just we can't assess all the damages yet because there's too too much active fire. There's too much active trees falling down, etc. So uh, it's going to be a little bit longer because uh, we we obviously had the extension extensive damage here. And, and sheriff, you do have that number that people can call if they want a deputy to check on a house in Detroit. Is that right? Yes. Again, the number to ch to have someone check on your house in Detroit and Idana is five zero three. 798-6823. That's seven days a week from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Our deputies will do that for you. But Bill, specifically the uh, the Forest Service uh, Ranger or station there, uh, right across from the state park, is still standing. When we drove by there Wednesday, uh, the State Forest Building uh, at North Fork Road is gone. Uh, commissioners, if you don't mind, there, there is a, an important safety, public safety message I'd like to deliver, and this is the perfect forum to do it, because um, virtually every residential property up the canyon has a septic system that served it. Um, we need to be getting the word out to folks that as they return, um, a compromised, structurally compromised uh, septic tank can be extremely dangerous. It's like having a trap door that sometimes you can't even see. Um, so we'll be delivering that message out to folks that as they start to access their site, and especially during early access when, when folks don't have all the information they, they might need. Um, be very, very cognizant of uh, the, the potential presence of septic sites out on residential and commercial properties. That, like I said, that message will be going out, but I thought this would be the perfect forum to start that message because um, it really is a significant danger for folks that are unaware. 
Can you just describe that in more yeah, Just detail? be clear, it's collapse that you would be worried about there. Well, um, for well over a decade now, I don't think anybody's put in a concrete septic tank. They're all plastic, and so ground fire moves in. It, it compromises the plastic, but the ground can still bridge over the tank sometimes. So it looks like it's firm but until you step on it. And like I said, it's, it's just like having a trap door in your yard to a, a tank you don't want to enter. Thank you all for your time. Appreciate it.